four victories on that issue, the most recent one in Massachusetts. The Beckett Fund made headlines last year uh, when we secured a decision from the U.S. Supreme Court in the landmark Hosanna Tabor case. In that case, the Supreme Court affirmed unanimously that religious groups have the right to hire and fire their own ministers without government interference. But I'm not going to talk about the, the gamut today. Today I want to focus us in on one issue. And I want to do that because I think it's one of the most significant threats to religious freedom that we've faced in decades. I can't really think of a more significant one right now. And that is the HHS contraceptive abortifacient mandate. The mandate is the result of a regulation passed by the Federal Department of Health and Human Services. It's not a law passed by Congress, although it's based on authority given to the HHS in the ACA. That's what I'm going to call the Obamacare health care law. The HHS contraceptive abortifacient mandate requires employers to cover contraceptives and related patient counseling at no cost to their employees. Now, HHS defines contraceptives to include not just drugs and devices that prevent the fertilization of an egg by a sperm, but also drugs like the morning after pill that sometimes work by making the uterus inhospitable for a newly fertilized egg, which means in simple terms that it causes a really early abortion. This morning I was reading a brief filed by the Christian Medical Association in the Hobby Lobby case. And they brought up issues related to another one of these contraceptive drugs that many religious believers would really regard as abortifacients. And that's the week after pill, Ella. They said that although it's labeled by the FDA as contraception, Ella works the same way as RU486, the well-known abortion drug by blocking progesterone, a hormone necessary to build and maintain the uterine wall during pregnancy, this kind of drug can either prevent a developing human embryo from implanting in the uterus, or it can kill an implanted utero embryo by essentially starving it to death. Put another way, according to the Christian Medical Association, Ella can abort a pregnancy. The HHS contraceptive and abortifacient mandate, now you see why I call it that, was a major change in the law. In 2007, the Eighth Circuit had ruled that employers were entitled to exclude contraceptives from their health insurance plans under federal law. And they did that not in a case brought by a religion, a religious group like a church or a religiously affiliated hospital but in a case involving Union Pacific Railroad. Now, it's true that before HHS passed the contraceptive abortifacient mandate, 26 law states had contraceptive equity laws on the books. But all of those laws contain a major escape clause. According to the National Women's Law Center, employers could avoid complying with any of these state contraceptive laws by establishing self-funded insurance plans when they themselves were willing to pay for their employees' drugs and reimburse them. And indeed, that's what many religious employers did prior to the ACA. Wheaton College is one well-known example. Wheaton College is an evangelical Christian university uh, in Illinois. Illinois is one of the states that had a so-called contraceptive equity law on the books requiring employers to fund contraceptives in their insurance plans. Rather than complying with this objectionable law, Wheaton established a separate self-funded pharmacy plan so that the drugs that its employees obtained under their, um, under their insurance plan were actually paid for directly by Wheaton. Because federal law governs such self-funded plans, Wheaton was able to get around the state contraceptive mandate in Illinois. But the ACA changed all that. There's no more escape clause that religious employers or religiously motivated employers can use to get around the objectionable mandate. We know that these drugs are unacceptable to millions of religious Americans. But although the administration 
has exempted plans covering nearly 90 million Americans from the contraceptive mandate for political reasons in order to keep President Obama's pledge that everyone can keep the health plan that they had when ACTA was passed. HHS has refused to exempt a single religious business owner from the mandate based on their conscientious objection to paying for contraceptives or abortion-causing drugs. There are at least 14 lawsuits brought by business owners across the nation. There is, they've been brought by a variety of groups, including Kelly's group, ADF, ACLJ, other people you're familiar with. But I'm going to narrow in a little bit on Hobby Lobby, because that's the case that I'm most familiar with. Beckett's client, Hobby Lobby, is a family-owned business that was founded over 30 years ago in David Green's garage. Since then, it's grown into a multi-billion dollar chain of craft stores. Some of you may have even shopped there. I know I did before this case. Um, all of these stores are wholly owned and controlled by the Green family. Each member of the Green family has signed a pledge to run their business in accordance with biblical principles. Hobby Lobby closes on Sundays, they play Christian music in their store, they own an affiliated chain of Christian bookstores, and they take out ads every Christmas and Easter in which they invite their customers and the readers of the ads to come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. David Green wrote a book about his successful business in 2005, and you know what he called one of the chapters? This is not a secular business. Tell that to HHS. In the Hobby Lobby case, HHS's lawyers have argued that business owners don't have religious liberty at all when it comes to how they run their businesses. According to HHS, that's because the corporate form, which was designed centuries ago to limit liability, insulates them from the moral consequences of their actions. Now, I used to be a big firm lawyer. And I don't think that argument would have really worked if I tried to defend one of my corporate clients who would, they have been accused of some kind of malfeasance. I think the government would still have said that they were morally culpable for their actions taken in the name of the corporation. And the Supreme Court certainly hasn't applied similar logic when it has repeatedly upheld the religious freedom rights of incorporated churches or incorporated religious schools like just last year in Hosanna Tabor. So then HHS has to introduce another distinction to say that it, it's really only for-profit corporations that don't affect their owner's religious liberty. But of course, there's nothing in the First Amendment that says that you lose your religious liberty when you make a living. And in Oklahoma, the state where Hobby Lobby is located, the same General Corporation Act under which Hobby Lobby has become an incorporated entity applies to both for-profit and non-profit corporations. In fact, just yesterday, the Oklahoma Attorney General filed a brief in the Hobby Lobby case to let the court know that a church could incorporate under this same law and asked the court why a church wouldn't have religious liberty rights if it did so. So all that to say, legally speaking, the HHS's wall of separation between nonprofit and for-profit businesses doesn't really hold up. Last year, HHS promised that it would come up with an accommodation for religious believers. It even suggested that the accommodation might include some kind of help for for-profit business owners. But now that you are familiar with the arguments that HHS has been making in court, you won't be surprised to learn that when HHS came out with its latest proposal regarding the contraceptive abortifacient mandate, it didn't include any protection for for-profit businesses at all. Instead, under this new proposal, only churches are completely exempt from the contraceptive mandate. They're the only entities who are completely able to opt out and offer their employees health insurance that does not include religiously prohibited drugs. For religious nonprofits like hospitals and schools, 
HHS has proposed a pretty convoluted accommodation, that's what it calls it, that would require these these organizations' insurers to automatically issue standalone contraceptive and abortifacient policies to all of its students and employees. And then it requires the insurers to send out letters to all women of childbearing age covered by the policies, teenage daughters of employees, students at religious schools, to let them know that they have this standalone policy and they can get these objectionable drugs at no cost to themselves. Religious leaders have not been pleased with this. Uh, Cardinal Timothy Dolan, who's president of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, said this proposal appears to offer second-class status to our first-class institutions in Catholic health care, Catholic education, Catholic charities, and criticized HHS for offering what it calls an accommodation rather than accepting the fact that these ministries are integral to our church and worthy of the same exemption as our Catholic churches. That's Cardinal Dolan. When HHS floated a similar proposal last year, over 200,000 members of the public spoke up. Many of them, we think the overwhelming majority actually, although there's no real way to tell, in favor of religious liberty. Now we come to the part of the speech that's a little bit interactive you thought you were going to get off with just listening. This time around, it's truly critical that religious believers, and indeed all people of goodwill who are committed to our nation's founding principles of freedom of conscience, speak up again and let HHS know that it's not acceptable to draw lines around the First Amendment. Religious business owners are as much entitled to conscience protections as churches and seminaries. Americans do not lose their First Amendment rights when they go to work. HHS also needs to know that it should just abandon this convoluted two-tier exemption and accommodation system and extend the exemption to all religious groups whether or not they meet the IRS's definition of a church. That's the simplest and the fairest solution for everybody. The HHS proposal is open for comment until April 8, 2013. There are handouts on the chairs with a link where you can upload comments. No matter what your view is about drugs covered by the mandate, I hope that you'll take my challenge up and speak out to urge HHS to adopt a regulation that respects the religious liberty of all Americans. As Seamus, Beckett's founder, always says, there's no use being the last one to be eaten by the bear. <laughs>